These stories are tales that have once been on the channel, and have been removed by myself for one reason or another. I feel it's time to give them a second life. Welcome to the Archives. Item number SCP-1471 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures all mobile devices that have SCP-1471 installed are to be confiscated and analyzed for any potential leads to other possibly affected devices. Afterwards, affected devices are to have their batteries removed, be assigned a designation, and be placed in Storage Unit 91 at Research Site 45. All online application stores for mobile devices are to be monitored to prevent any inadvertent sales of SCP-1471. Suspected devices are to be targeted using self-uploading malware in order to disable the device until it can be seized by field agents. Description SCP-1471 is a free 9.8 megabyte application for mobile devices named Mallow version 1.0.0 in online application stores. SCP-1471 has no listed developer and is somehow able to bypass the application approval process to go directly to distribution. SCP-1471 is also able to avoid removal by other program manager applications. After SCP-1471 is installed, no icons or shortcuts are created for the application. SCP-1471 will then begin to send the individual images through text messaging every three to six hours. All images will contain SCP-1471-A either within the background or foreground. SCP-1471-A appears as a large humanoid figure with a canid-like skull and black hair. During the first 24 hours following the installation of the SCP, the mobile device will receive images taken at locations commonly frequented by the individual. After 48 hours, the mobile device will receive images taken at locations that were recently visited by the individual. After 72 hours, the mobile device will receive images of the individual in real time with SCP-1471-A appearing within close proximity to the subject. Individuals with greater than 90 hours of exposure to these continuous images will begin to briefly visualize the SCP within their peripheral vision, reflective surfaces, or a combination of the two. Continued exposure to SCP-1471 after this point will cause irreversible and sustained visualizations of SCP-1471-A. Individuals at this stage have reported periodic attempts made by the SCP to visually communicate with them, but fail to understand or comprehend these actions. Currently, the only known treatment to reverse SCP-1471's effect is to eliminate the individual's visual exposure to those images prior to 90 hours after installation. To date, no apparent hostile activity has been reported regarding SCP-1471-A. Level 2 Access Required Archival Document 1471-01 Access Granted Mallow Version 1.0.0 Description Never settle for those awkward feelings of being alone ever again. Mallow 
is an exciting and interactive experience that will keep you engaged and intrigued. The anxiety of social situations can be nerve-wracking, but after just a few hours of Mallow, you will soon forget all about those painful emotions of disappointment. Be part of the new craze that is quickly becoming the next social substitute. Remember, the more you participate, the more Mallow will engage you. Your experience is completely up to you. Absolutely no ads. Enjoy. The Tail I was scared when I first saw him. It happened just as you told me. The messages, the pictures, seeing him around every corner afterwards. I was so young. Who wouldn't have lost it? William sighed. By then, he was over the creature following him. It wasn't like it was going to go away, no matter how much he begged or pleaded or attempted to bribe. He knew that the best and only situation would be just to get used to Capone being there. At least he had the solace of knowing he wasn't going insane. Believe me, William, I know many people have reacted the same way. Fear is a more common reaction to the unknown than you'd think. Dr. Laura Brenz consoled him. These cases weren't exactly common, but they were commonly known. It's not even that I'm afraid of him anymore. I mean, listen, he makes me jump when I see him in the morning. I don't think I'll just ever get used to that. It's the bad connotations he has, William rebutted. I know he does that, but it happened two years ago. I know it's hard for you, especially with your shadow, but you need to carry on. Dr. Bren stated. William just sighed as she continued. Our session is almost up. We made some real progress, William. I want you to go do something for me when you get home. Do you have any homework or anything? No, I did it all on my break. Good. When you get home... I want you to think back to your first experience and write as much as you feel comfortable sharing. Is that alright? Yeah, alright. Thanks for seeing me. It wasn't too long a drive from the doctor's office to home. Five, possibly ten minutes if there was a train. He always saw the creature through the rear view mirror when he drove, riding in the back seat. It looked innocent in its own alien way, waving to William as he saw it. Despite everything, William found himself talking to it, like one would talk to a dog or a cat about their day when they're alone. It seemed to listen when he talked, and after a while, he could swear that it understood. It's hard to tell with a face like that. So... All there was to go by were various head tilts and waves, and even then, he had to teach it how to wave. At least I know you're interested. Drop the backpack near the door. Go to the patio. Wave to Capone from the mirror, fridge, drink, chair, and crash. William's afternoon routine was more clockwork than it should be. He thought back to his session with Dr. Brenz. She wanted me to try and recapture the experience when I first saw him. Hmm. William mumbled as he grabbed a few sheets of paper and a pen. And bit by bit, he pieced together the sequence of events that led up to this point. I've had Capone with me ever since I was 15 years old. I remember that my 20-year-old sister, Sarah, brought up an app that she downloaded earlier at the dinner table one night. She had no idea how it does it, but hazarded a guess 
that it tracks you through your phone's GPS and sends you pictures of places you've been with a really cute monster placed in the photo to make it look like it's following you. It didn't seem that weird. I recall that Google Maps could get a decent ground photo at the time, so just add Photoshop to that and you'd have a gimmick. Plus, we knew it couldn't be a virus. The App Store checks every app for things like that before peddling it. The only thing I found legitimately off about it at the time was that it was both free and adless. Her explanation of it sounded pretty cool to me, so I asked Sarah to help me download it on my phone. She told me that while my old hand-me-downed flip phone did have something like an app store, it most likely did not have Mallow. It didn't stop her from looking though. Sarah was a good sister. She really could have told me to just get out of her hair, but she always took time out of her day for me, packing my lunch, playing with me, bringing me to R-rated movies that I was clearly way too young for. I was lucky to have her as a legal guardian when our parents went away. I was too young to process it all when it happened. But mom and dad died from a head-on collision with a drunk driver. Sarah took care of me as my legal guardian up until I moved out for college. God knows where I'd be if she didn't. After some prodding, she found the app, which was a surprise to the both of us. It was obvious that my phone didn't have any kind of GPS, but neither of us had even thought about it until much, much later. Soon enough, I received my first picture. I'll never understand the way Sarah saw the world, if that was her idea of cute. The photo was taken in my school's courtyard with the creature I'd soon call Capone, sitting on one of the benches. You could barely see him, but there he was covered in his black matted fur, with his knife-like claws, a set of blank, pure white eyes, and that face, which was merely a skull belonging to some kind of large beast, looking directly at us with that large, wolfish grin. I gave the phone back to Sarah, telling her how terrifying it was and that I didn't want the messages anymore. She just jokingly punched my shoulder, saying, Oh, don't be such a baby. It is too cute. Look how happy he is to meet you. I looked back at his face, his wide grin specifically. And I have to admit, I laughed at that. It was just the sheer wrongness of that statement that made me listen to the next. I'm sure he'll grow on you eventually. I'll tell you what, if you want, you can put up with him for one whole week, and we'll go see that movie you wanted to see. If he still gives you nightmares, we'll delete it. And if you end up liking it, we'll laugh about it later. Deal? I looked at the picture again. It appeared that getting a photo every now and then was the extent this was going to go to. And looking at it in hindsight, I probably would have kept it on for the next to nothing if she really wanted me to, so I agreed. Sarah was ecstatic after that and assured me that I wouldn't regret it while showing me some of her own pictures. She only had three so far, one at her office one at the park, and another on the road we lived on, each picture containing her own clearly visible entity. I must have looked nervous or something because she suggested that I name mine like she did with her, Cassandra. And I thought about it for a bit. Let me make something clear though, because it seems to come up whenever I tell people this. I did not name my Mallow Capone because of the incident with my parents. 
I didn't even know that mom and dad's arrest involved alcohol at the time. I named him after a history lesson I found amusing in school where people's fear got the best of them, and as my teacher put it, it ended up doing more harm than good. It was intended as a reminder that I shouldn't be making the same mistake. I saw a bit of light in this whole thing after giving it a mock title and thought it wasn't going to be that bad. I went to bed, and my normal life went on for just a little while longer. I continued to get pictures of Capone for a while, following me at school, the bus stop, my street, virtually everywhere I went. It wasn't until the third or fourth day when I got called in from class. I was thinking that I was in trouble for something, even if I didn't know what, but as soon as I saw Sarah, that feeling was stifled. She looked very shaken. The instant she saw me, she immediately yanked my arm and brought me to the car. Sarah was not looking good at all. She kept asking questions about Capone. Things like if I ever saw him or if I received any photos from him with me in the images. I haven't checked anything from today. But when I checked, there were two. I remembered exactly when and where those messages were taken. Because during them, I made a mental note that I got some texts from Capone. They've been sent as soon as they've been taken. Sarah knew that we were being pursued by something. She probably had no idea by what they were and I knew she had no idea how they were doing it, but she knew that they knew where we lived. She couldn't figure out how to delete it. She said she tried everything, but couldn't find a way to get it off. She couldn't even find where the app went. I'm not sure what we were planning to do, but before we could even fully plan a course of action, I got another text. Sarah froze and stared at me, as if to say, don't look at it. If I didn't, I could have had a semi-normal life right now. It would have been over the news within the week, and we would have known. But I did it. I opened the phone, and there we were just sitting there with that fear-stricken look on our face. The photo was clearly taken from the hood of the moving car, giving us a clear view of what was behind us. He took up most of the back seat and towered over me. We both turned around, preparing to scream at the monstrosity behind us, but when we did, the seat was empty. We didn't know what was happening or what to make of it, but we felt that the only thing to do is run away, abandoning the car. We hastily ditched the car, ran the rest of the way to the apartment, and locked the door behind us. We locked ourselves in the bathroom and waited. We just stayed there, even when we got a message from Cassandra or Capone Sarah would scream at them, asking why they were following us, and begged us to be left alone. We felt helpless against them. All we felt we could do was just sit in the bathroom and hope they would go away. The room felt like our only safe haven, until we were exposed to them for too long. Sarah started to panic, saying that she kept seeing one of them behind her. I wasn't seeing it, though. I was more concerned about trying to calm her down by telling her that maybe they weren't really there than I was about seeing Capone in the mirror. I convinced Sarah that we needed to leave the room out of necessity. We couldn't stay in the apartment forever, and if they wanted to get us... 
they would have done so already. We called the police and here we are. We both got help, but I was the lucky one. Everyone's case was different in terms of interaction, but for me, Capone was always in a mirror or some reflective thing large enough to show him. He was predictable, and I could find ways to block him out when I needed it. I learned how to expect Capone, and after a while, he kind of grew on me. I used to have a makeshift curtain that I would pull over the mirrors when I didn't want to see him, but I started using that curtain less and less as time went on. Capone always seemed to try and interact with me, even if I didn't understand what he was trying to say most of the time. I started to greet Capone with a casual wave as I passed by him from the living room mirror, and eventually, he started to wave back. He kind of became a constant companion to me, and I adjusted to Capone just as he adjusted to me. My case wasn't as severe as Sarah's. She saw Cassandra everywhere she looked, around every corner, just out of sight, and over her while she slept. Sarah, well, she took her own life two years ago. I wanted to blame the Mallows for it, but I can't. Following the person who looks at their messages is just what they do. Now, every time I see Capone, I'm reminded of what I did in the car that day. I knew I shouldn't have picked up that text. If I didn't, she would still be here. It was almost four hours since William started writing, but he almost felt relieved. He's never actually told anyone about this in such detail before. The majority of what happened was kept between himself and Capone. He looked up to the creature in the mirror from across the room for a few seconds, as he gave the old, familiar wave. William was silent for a minute staring at Capone, and then back to his papers. He felt the need to make one last point. But then again, how would I have known? I don't know who made the Mallows or why. I don't even know if anyone actually made the app. Many things like it have been created naturally, or have been given some kind of anomaly out of sheer chance. It would make so much sense if some physical thing was to blame, but there's none that I can legitimately find. None on the Mallows. None on me. Just on chance. SCP-1867 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-1867 is to be kept in a 40 by 70 by 30 centimeter aquatic specimen tank. No additional security measures are necessary. SCP-1867's environment and the care thereof are identical to that of non-anomalous members of the species. Recovered items relating to SCP-1867 are to be placed in Secure Storage Vault 16. Access to these items and to SCP-1867 itself is, with permission, of an appropriate Level 2 staff member. Description SCP-1867 is a neuter branch of the species Nembrotha, which is a variable neon slug. It measures 4.6 inches in length. There are no physical differences between SCP-1867 and any other member of its species. SCP-1867 is sapient, incapable of telepathic communication with individuals within 5 meters. It identifies itself as 
Lord Theodore Thomas Blackwood, a British explorer and naturalist. No such individual appears in any municipal records. SCP-1867 speaks with terminology and style appropriate to late 19th century England, and is generally friendly and cooperative with researchers. SCP-1867 makes repeated claims of past exploits and accomplishments, including service in the Second Opium War, expeditions to remote regions of the world, and encounters with various rare creatures and peoples. Despite the questionable validity of many of its claims, SCP-1867 has shown in-depth knowledge of geography, zoology, botany, archaeology, anthropology, and linguistics related to its claimed regions of exploration, as well as more esoteric fields such as obscure mythology, mysticism, and cryptozoology. However, SCP-1867 does not seem to realize or willfully ignores any events or information dating after approximately 1910. When requested to give proof of its exploits, SCP-1867 provided an address in England, claiming that it would be more than willing to donate its collection. Investigation of the address led to the cottage owned by one Mrs. Redacted, who claimed to be keeping the house for Lord Blackwood. Further questioning failed to reveal any details of SCP-1867's nature or origins beyond what information SCP-1867 had already provided. Mrs. Redacted died of a heart failure five days after the Foundation agents began investigations. Investigation of the cottage revealed an underground vault containing over 3,000 artifacts, zoological and botanical specimens, a library containing over 5,000 items, and a functioning, if outdated, laboratory. All materials within collection were removed and relocated by the Foundation over the course of three weeks. The Tale May 14th, 1883 I received the most curious missive in the post this morning. It had been four months since I returned to England, having nearly lost my life in endeavoring to become the first man to reach the summit of the foreboding and deadly Mount Everest. I have spent the time since in research and recovery here in London, nursing my wounds and documenting my memoirs of the harrowing trip up the mountain and my nearly fatal encounter with the creature I found there, a tale which, I fear, may never be told outside these diaries, and I have not planned to embark again for distant shores until after summer has passed. That has changed, I fear, as the result of today's letter. It was a formal affair, written in a folded card like a wedding invitation, sealed in the finest envelope and I present it to you below. To Lord Theodore Thomas Blackwood, CBE. Colonel Joseph d'Infante, l'Armée de Terre of the Republic of France, does hereby cordially invite you to participate in a hunt of a great and terrible creature that threatens the lives of thousands. The Tarasque, a creature great and terrifying, of late believed to be legend, has arisen and threatens the security of the land and province and of France itself. Colonel de Infante has been authorized by the President of the Republic to pay a sum of five million English pounds to the man or men who shall slay this infamous beast. RSVP in care of Colonel de Infante, number 22, Kensington Road, Knightsbridge, London. I immediately dashed off an acceptance and sent it out with the afternoon post, though 
I have hunted foxes and elephants, and every beast great and small in between. I had never heard of such a creature as the Tarasque, and certainly never had an opportunity to hunt one. I spent my afternoon in the study, poring over encyclopedia and tomes of history and mythology. And before I found the term in a collection of folk tales regarding St. Martha, sister to Mary Magdalene, who had supposedly calmed the beast with her song. The text described it as a vicious creature, a massive chimera, that breathed fire and whose scaly hide repelled every blade, and that killed without remorse and seemed only to wreck chaos for its own enjoyment. When the last delivery of the day came just before tea time, I had received an address and directions to attend a briefing the day after tomorrow in the city. I have always been a firm believer in the proposition that even in the most preposterous of myths, there lies a kernel of truth. Whether an ancient behemoth that breathed fire was bringing ruination in the south of France, I knew not. But I knew that the army and that the president themselves were concerned enough to seek out a man such as myself and were willing to offer a bounty that would finance a score of proper expeditions for the killing of a single beast. On Wednesday, I will learn why. May 16th, 1883 Today I attended Colonel de Infante's meeting, held in a private room in the city, at the club owned by Messrs. Marshall, Carter, and Dark. Lest the reader question my morality, I assure you that I am no member, dues-paying or otherwise, of that association. I find their stock and trade offensive and deplorable, and their clientele even more so. But on this day, the windowless establishment was free of its usual throng of libertines and bohemians replaced by a handful of officers and men in the uniforms of the French. A handful of our own soldiers guarding the door. Servants and waiters, apparently relieved to be in our company, rather than that of their usual employers, offered drinks and hors d'oeuvres to their guests. Besides myself, there were three guests of honor at the meeting. There was an American, Mr. Roosevelt, a young man who made for himself already quite a name as a hunter of big game in the American West. There was Mr. Dukov, a Russian I knew of by reputation as a scientist and a historian. And lastly, there was another Englishman, by the name of Mr. Harris, whom readers of these pages may recall as he whom I matched wits with on the banks of the Nile in 1855. I will spare the reader the excruciating details of our past intercourse. Suffice it to say that Mr. Harris and I were schoolmates at Eton, that I regarded him then as little more than a common blackguard, and that what news I have heard of him since then has given me little reason to change my assessment of his personage. Colonel D'Infante, a short middle-aged man who bore signs of great fatigue and worry, spoke briefly and elaborated on his reasons for calling on the four of us. The being that his government had come to call. The Tarask, he said, had first appeared the Sunday after Easter near the village of Tarascon, named most coincidentally for the mythical beast itself and had destroyed the town utterly, claiming several thousand souls in the process. The handful of survivors who escaped the devastation had described the great lizard, nimble and merciless, that had charged directly into the town square, and destroyed everyone and everything in its path, crushing, smashing, and devouring people, livestock, and buildings alike. And one man, a farmer whose wife and children had been ripped to shreds by the beast, claimed that it spoke to him. 
in plain French and told him of them. Since then, the colonel said three outlying villages and countless farms and province had fallen to the Tarasque. It attacked without mercy or reason, killed indiscriminately, and left only devastation in its wake. The army had sent men and horses and cavalry against it. There were few survivors, and those who lived claimed the beast had been struck directly by artillery, and neither flagged nor missed the step, the hole in its chest seemingly knitting together as it charged their position. The entire region had been quarantined. Citizens were being evacuated by the thousands, and the army and the press were passing stories of plagues and Prussian revanchists. But his government feared the worst would soon to come pass. The four of us, the colonel claimed, were the finest hunters and scientific minds available and known to his government. He knew not if we were capable of taking down such a monster, but between our expert knowledge and unique access to the finest tools and weapons known to science, he hoped we could succeed where his own forces had failed. I left a meeting with a stack of papers, details of the army's knowledge of the Tarrasque based on the reconnaissance they have to date endeavored. And on Saturday, the four of us will board a steamer across the channel and travel to the epicenter of this pandemonium ourselves. Deeds, my loyal valet has begun packing my bags, and is having more exotic ornaments in my arsenal prepared for shipping. And I do not anticipate working with Mr. Harris any more than I anticipate shaking hands with the devil. But Messrs. Roosevelt and Dukov appear to be of sound mind and fine spirit, and with luck, our motley quartet shall return to England with a fortune in her pockets, and a story to tell. May 20th, 1883 We disembarked in Avignon after an uneventful trip by train from Calais. It may seem strange for a globetrotter such as myself, but until this weekend, I have never had occasion to travel to France. After all, it is a civilized place lacking in the ancient mysteries and elusive game that is my passion, or so I have thought. Mr. Roosevelt and I spent many hours sharing our tales of adventure, and I find him a true intellectual who understands what it means to be a naturalist. Mr. Dukov, I found more difficult to talk to. He is a private man who prefers the company of his books and his studies to that of his fellows. He proudly displayed a variety of his own inventions he intended to test against the Tarrasque. A gun that fires beams of electricity. A jellied kerosene that burns without exploding. And what he described as his latest prototype. A large rifle on a tripod, fueled by refined pitch blend, which I suspect is not entirely different than Mr. Moth's destabilizing muskets one of which I had brought myself. I did my best to avoid speaking to Mr. Harris during the trip. I intend during our expedition to be no less than a gentleman, but the man leaves a sour taste in my mouth. When we boarded the train at Calais, I watched as he had a large crate loaded onto the train, which he told us contained his secret weapon. He refused to tell us what the box contained, but viewing it made me uncomfortable. The air seemed to chill as it was carried by. In any event, it is too large to fit in our wagon, and for now we shall be leaving it in a bank vault in Avignon. Our weapons and provisions have been loaded onto a wagon and horses have been readied for us, and tomorrow... Colonel D'Enfante will escort us to the edge of the quarantine zone, and from there, he says, the four of us 
shall be on our own. He could spare no more soldiers, lest the beast attack the fortifications directly and break loose. May 21st, 1883 I have seen the horrors of war often enough in my years. I saw the wrath of the British Empire firsthand when I led troops in the Opium Wars, and in Africa I have seen native tribes fight to the last man, destroying everything in their path. In the Crimea, I barely escaped with my life as thousands of men fought and died and cities were laid bare. The destruction I saw there pales in comparison to what I have beheld in the Tarasks wake. Having Yaw itself look like a city at war, soldiers patrolling the streets, barricades at the edge of town, and not far outside the city we reached the edge of the quarantine zone. Soldiers had been hard at work digging trenches and erecting fortifications. The young men keeping watch looked battle-scarred as though they had seen an indescribable horror. Constant stream of evacuees made their way out of the area. Women and children, and some with little more than the clothes on their back. Many looked confused and agitated, as if they had no clue why they were being removed from their homes. And on the faces of others there was no doubt. I asked on passing if any of them had yet seen the Tarask. Only a few, the scouts and lookouts. They had seen it from a distance, I was told, for nobody had engaged the beast at close range and was still alive. It had not yet dared to attack the perimeter the army had erected, but two days prior, a watchman told me, he had spotted it a mile from the front line seemingly staring back at him. Mr. Harris grudgingly agreed to ride out alone and scout for the beast, while Mr. Roosevelt and Mr. Dukov and I followed the road to Tariscon to learn what we could of the nature of our quarry. Tariscon itself was a scene of utter ruination. Bodies lay by the score in the streets where they had fallen. Much of the town had been consumed by fire. The town's famous castle and other stone buildings dashed to rubble, and massive holes torn in the walls that remained standing. We saw not a living soul, no man or woman, no livestock nor vermin, no birds or beasts of the field. Even the greenery of the town seemed to have been destroyed and I began to feel pangs of doubt in my stomach as we surveyed the scene. Could one creature have truly wrecked such devastation? We set up camp on the edge of the dead town. Mr. Harris returned by evening and informed us he had spotted the Tarask in the southwest, near the village of Bellegarde, in the act of destroying a farmhouse. Its route, he said, had not been difficult to trace, for a swath of barren land seemed to lay a trail, and even the grass itself was not safe from the Tarask wrath. And tomorrow, we will follow the trail and engage the beast. May 22nd, 1883 We have met the Tarask this day, and we are lucky to have escaped with our lives. We traveled southwest to Belleville, which we found in a state of destruction not unlike that of Tarascon itself. From there, we followed the creature's trail as it meandered south, then west, then northwest through the farmlands, drawing uncomfortably close to nines. And shortly after midday, we spotted the creature in the distance. It was stationary, seeming to nap in the afternoon sun. It was a massive thing, longer than a whale and taller than a giraffe, and it looked to outweigh either. Its scales glistened in the sun, and its teeth, massive and shining, were bared as it rested among the chaos it had wrought. Had it wings, I would have called it a dragon. 
With our weapons in tow, we stealthily approached the beast to a range of less than a hundred feet. Mr. Dukov set up his pitch blend gun, which he claimed would take some time to charge before it could be fired, while Mr. Roosevelt and Mr. Harris prepared their elephant guns, and I readied my particle beam destabilizer. Behind a short fence, demarcating one of the now abandoned farms, we drew straws, and it was agreed I would take the first shot at the abomination. Steadying my gun against the fence, I took careful aim for the sleeping Tarask's head. I held my breath, made my final adjustment, and fired. The shot hit square and true, and we watched with delight as the top of the Tarask's head was shorn clean off. The beast slumped to the ground, and I breathed a sigh of relief. In one shot, the beast that had killed thousands and menaced a nation was dead. Mr. Harris let out a cheer, and the dead beast came back to life. It rose to its feet and turned in our direction. Blood, brains, and gore oozed from its skull as a head missing an eye stared at us. It let out a blood-curdling roar before it charged at us faster than a bull elephant. Mr. Roosevelt and Mr. Harris barely had time to fire around each at the beast before we were forced to scatter. Harris tossed aside his elephant gun for a smaller repeater he had been carrying, and discharged a magazine in the Tarask's flank. And we watched in horror as the wounds it took sealed themselves within seconds. Mr. Dukal was forced to shut down his pitch blend gun before it could finally charge, and fired his electric rifle three times into the monster's open wound, stunning it for long enough for us to reach our horses. By the time we were on horseback, the beast was up again and charging us, and flesh and bone was knitting anew over the open cavity in its skull. I fired the particle destabilizer again at its foreleg and took it off entirely, hobbling it as it tried to chase us on three legs. We rode in four directions and agreed to meet behind the quarantine line. I saw the beast attempt to take off in pursuit of Mr. Roosevelt as the stump of its leg began to grow and take new form, but he was able to elude the Goliath, and by nightfall, we were among the soldiers at the barricade, our pride injured, but otherwise in good health. May 28th, 1883 Luck and Providence have provided, well, thus far. The Tarask has made no effort to escape the quarantine area and has proven content to ravage the abandoned farms of province and feed liberally on the animals and plants left behind. After our second attempt to attack the Tarask on the 23rd proved no more successful than the first, we have come to a conclusion that the beast cannot be killed simply by gunshot or electrification, or setting it aflame. For the rate at which it heals its injuries is so great, and its tolerance for pain and mutilation so high, that even the mighty broadsides of the Royal Navy would have little chance of destroying it before it could take their lives in trade. To slay the Tarask, we determined, we would have to immobilize it and deal such destruction upon it it would be utterly annihilated before it could be freed. We discussed for several hours how such a thing could be achieved, before an old sergeant who had been manning the night watch begged our ears. The sergeant had, he said, fought in Vietnam when the natives were tempted to rebel against the French in 68, and had seen them make use of a trap that was elegant, easily disguised, and deadly, and Mr. Roosevelt and I talked over the fine points of the idea well into the night, and the next day the four of us traveled into the field to lay our trap. We prepared our trap in the fields near Gravesen, 
a village between Tarascon and Avignon, that the Tarasque had yet to lay waste to, and where the water table was amenable to our task. By careful observation, we had judged that the beast stood about nine feet at shoulder, six feet wide, and thirty feet long. With the help of a few soldiers whom Colonel D'Infante had grudgingly conceded to parting with, we dug a long trench in the field wide and long enough to contain the beast, and deep enough to stop the beast from climbing loose before the damage could be done. In the bottom of the pit we mounted steel rods, sharpened to a fine point. By the hundreds, each tipped with a noxious poison which I acquired in the Orient, running lengthwise through the center of the pit, we built a wooden bridge, large and sturdy enough to accommodate a man on horseback, but not so sturdy that it would not break and shatter under the weight of the Tarasque. Four days we were involved in the earthwork. The digging done, we laid a net across the top, and it was covered with grass and leaves. And from a distance, it looked to all the world like an ordinary patch of open land, beneath which laid doom. Mr. Harris had spotted the terrasque not two miles from our location, and tomorrow we will spring the trap. Mr. Roosevelt has agreed to act as bait. He will approach the Tarasque on horseback and attack at once with his elephant gun. And once it gives chase, he will lure it to the pit. He is to gallop across the bridge and lure the Tarasque to follow him. And when it attempts to do so, it will surely fall into the pit. Messrs. Dukov and Harris and I, lying in wait out of sight, will then join Mr. Roosevelt at the pit's edge and unleash the full fury of our armaments onto it, our rifles and shotguns, the particle destabilizer, Mr. Dukov's electric rifle, and provided it has charged safely, he shall make his first firing of the Pitchenblen gun. Once our armaments have been exhausted, we shall pour four barrels of Mr. Dukov's jellied kerosene into the pit and ignite it. In providence, withstanding, nothing shall be left of the creature but ash and bone by sundown tomorrow. May 29th, 1883 Success! The plan went off without a hitch. It was afternoon before Mr. Roosevelt could coerce the Tarasque into pursuing him, but sure enough the reptilian behemoth fell into the pit, impaled upon the spikes, and was stuck while the four of us rained destruction from above. The monster let loose a screech from the pits of damnation itself as bullets and explosives tore its flesh loose bit by bit and jellied kerosene burned slowly and stopped it from regrowing. Mr. Dukov warned us to avert our eyes when he finally fired the pitchblend gun, and his warning was justified. The blast was bright enough to blind, and a massive plume of smoke and fire erupted from the pit after he had pulled the trigger, seeming to blossom into a mushroom above us. By the time the fires had died down, charred skeleton was all that remained. We have separated the beast's massive skull, blackened and perforated, from what remains of the monster, and a handful of soldiers who reported after the blast are hard at work filling the pit with earth. And tomorrow we shall bring the skull back to Avignon and collect our reward. May 30th 1883. Disaster. We were hailed as heroes by the army when we arrived in Avignon with our prize. In the morning light, the terrace skull seemed whiter than it had the night before, and more charred flesh stuck to it than it had seemed when we dragged it from the pit, though surely it was little more than an illusion. The four of us posed for photographs, and Mr. Dukov 
asked to have his photograph taken with his head in between the massive jaws of our fallen prey. Well, imagine our horror when the jaws snapped shut, severing Dukov's head neatly at the shoulders. The skull of the Tarrasque rolled loose from its place on the stage and snapped again, taking another chunk of his body. And the soldiers screamed and fainted as it seemed to be growing a new coating of flesh and scales over its charred exterior. We watched, shocked as the honor guards fired a volley at the skull. The chips it took off seemed to replace themselves instantly, and I was dumbfounded as sinew and muscle seemed to spread across the creature's bones and knit into shape. The jaws of the disembodied Tarrasque opened, and it shouted in French, You make me sick. From the other end of the plaza I heard more screams, and looked to see the impossible. The rest of the terrasse, covered in earth and grime, held together by a few lonely strands of muscle, and the headless carcass lurched through the square with uncanny speed, trampling men in its path, ignoring gunshot and cannon fire as it made to rejoin its body. From the corner of my eye I saw Mr. Harris take off running. Mr. Roosevelt noted, he was headed in the direction of the bank vault and his secret weapon, as the skull of the terrasse seemed to be making its way towards where I stood. I gave Harris chase. We found Mr. Harris having dragged the crate out of the vault into the lobby. Hurriedly prying the boards loose, soon the crate fell away, revealing a stone coffin that looked truly ancient. It felt as if all the heat fled the room when the sarcophagus was exposed, and I forced back a shudder as I beheld it. Three chains with massive locks held the lid in place, and the lid and casket itself were covered with hand-carved ruins that looked to be Sumerian. And I confess that I have not taken the time to learn the ancient languages of the Mesopotamia, but I felt the distinct sense of wrongness emanating from the box as Mr. Harris drew a ring with three keys from his coat and began to unlock the seals, one by one. I begged him to stop this madness and flee while we still had the chance, and he insisted that once open our victory would be secured. Mr. Harris pushed the lid aside and barely had a moment to regard his secret weapon in the flesh, before an olive-toned arm, sword in hand, lashed out from within the box, and sliced his head clean off. In all my years of adventuring among the primitives and wild men of the world, I have never set eyes on a man who looked so savage, so elemental, so full of primal rage as the being that now climbed from the coffin, naked, sword in hand, its long black hair flowing behind it, its body covered head to toe in tattoos of eldritch imagery and ancient languages that resembled no script written by man. Sherman, the American general, is said to have told his enemies, begging for mercy that they may as well appeal against the thunderstorm. What I beheld before me, I thought, was the very idolin of the storm. Mr. Roosevelt attempted to entreat with the man and beg its assistance, seeming to barely hear him. The godman set his eyes on Roosevelt and lunged with his sword, and Roosevelt parried with his rifle, the barrel cracking under its onslaught. And in surprise, the godman dropped the blade. Roosevelt picked it up and attempted to return the blow. And in an instant, the godman somehow held another sword in each hand. Mr. Roosevelt did his best to fend off his assailant's onslaught, but found himself cornered. Though I am loath to intervene in a fair fight between two honest men, I could not bear to see Mr. Roosevelt cut down in the midst of this pandemonium. 
I drew my pistol and emptied its cylinder, discharging five rounds into the godman's head. Though it should have been dead, the olive-skinned destroyer turned and stared me down. Like the Tarrasque, even with half its face gone, it seemed ready to kill. Dropping one of its blades, it moved its hand rapidly through the air and tossed something at me faster than I could react. And in an instant, I could not move my arms. The man had somehow materialized the bola, a weapon used by the cowmen of South America to immobilize fleeing animals, and it had tied itself securely around my chest. Another flick, and a second bola struck me around the legs, and I was down on the ground. He approached to land the killing blow, when behind me I saw the outer wall of the bank shudder and give way, and heard that offensive roar, the cry of the Tarrasque, nary a scratch upon it, as I entered the building in search of its would-be slayers. And the godman caught sight of the Tarrasque, and lost interest entirely in Mr. Roosevelt and I. This, I thought, must be why poor Mr. Harris considered him his secret weapon. This avatar of rage lived to fight, and in the Tarrasque, it had the ultimate rival. To describe the fight that ensued between these two unkillable titans would take a hundred pages or more. Mr. Roosevelt and I huddled in the safety of the bank vault, which alone seemed immune to the destruction the two reigned upon each other. After the better part of an hour had passed, hundreds lay dead around them the center of Avignon, little more than rubble. The godman was missing an arm and half a leg, an eye and the better part of his brain, and his stomach had been cut open. In a state where most men would be long dead, it continued to fight, severing even its own entrails and making weapons of them. The Tarrasque had suffered as badly. It was on the ground, recuperating. When I saw the godman take notice of Mr. Dukov's pistol gun, laying near what remained of the stage that an hour ago had been the site of such jubilation. As we watched, the godman removed the core of the pistol gun with uncanny precision. He made what seemed to be bombs and explosives appear, and it strapped them to the device's core, which he mounted on his chest, lighting a fuse. It charged at the Tarrasque as it readied itself to meet him. Having seen the fury of the pitchblind gun in a controlled state, Mr. Roosevelt and I had no desire to see what happened next. We retreated into the vault as a blinding light filled the square and a blistering wind, mightier than the hurricanes of the Caribbean, slammed the doors shut and sealed us within. It is dark. The light from my electric torch had provided just enough luminescence by which to write this account. I know not for how long the air in this vault will last. Aside from the lifeless body of Mr. Harris, there is nothing in this vault that approximates food or water. And as Christians and gentlemen, Mr. Roosevelt and myself have sworn not to pursue that dark path unless our lives themselves are on the line. I do not know if I will make it out of here alive. If I do not, let this diary be my last word and testament to the horrors that have befallen this corner of the world. June 13th, 1883. Providence smiled upon us after all in the end. On the morning of the first, the vault door opened and I regarded a major of the army and a company of men searching for survivors. Mr. Roosevelt and I were dehydrated and beginning to suffer from pitchblende fever. Unfortunately, I knew the address of one of my dear friend Henry's associates in Marcel, and upon being transported to hospital, he met us there and provided the treatments necessary to stab off the certain death that the malicious ague carries with it. 
Colonel de Infante is dead, I have learned, and at least 10,000 others who were incinerated when Avignon was consumed by flame. Even those who had survived, I learned, have been burned or blinded, and pitchblende fever will likely claim many of them in time. No sign has been seen of the Tarasque or the Godman since the explosion, nor, for that matter, of the icy sarcophagus in which he had apparently slept until the late Mr. Harris loosed him upon the city. It will take years, if not decades, to restore this ancient region to its former glory. We were two of only a handful of witnesses to one of the greatest disasters to strike France in recent memory, and having been at the center of it all, the army regarded us with great suspicion. We were interrogated several times, at first by soldiers, then by police, and then by politicians. And a man who looked English watched and took notes but said not a word as we told our story. In the end, we escaped transportation to Devil's Island, but the reward that had been promised was forfeit, and we were sternly warned that neither of us were welcome in France again so long as we lived. The explosion that claimed Avignon was seen for hundreds of miles, I learned and the press from Paris and New York were heavily embroiled in speculation. Everything from a falling star to a German superweapon to the wrath of God himself was being proposed as an explanation. We were warned not to share our personal knowledge of the event with others as we were sent on our way. Mr. Roosevelt and I parted ways in Calais. He intends to return to America, he informed me, and pursue a political career, and in that, I wished him well. I returned to my house in London this afternoon, and was informed by deeds that a postcard had arrived for me this morning. The handwriting in the brief, unsigned note within resembled that of the strange Englishman who had attended the questionings, whose notes I had caught brief glimpses of from time to time and I present that message to you below. To Lord Theodore Thomas Blackwood, CBE. The Royal Foundation for a Security, Containment, and Protection of Anomalous Objects and Phantasmagoria requests a meeting for the purpose of negotiating an alliance favorable to both our parties. Please call any time excepting Sundays, at number 19 Marylebone Road, Westminster, and ask to speak to Dr. Thursday. Your discretion is requested in this manner. I have not heard of this foundation before, and I do not know if I intend to take them upon their mysterious overture, but perhaps I shall hear them out. But I have never been one to serve in one man's employ for very long, and I value my freedom as a naturalist and explorer above all else. We shall see. Good evening, Doctor. No, no, don't stand up. And yes, I am who you think I am. Let's not make any more of this than it is. You know my number. And I know enough about you to make a duplicate that even your mother wouldn't be able to tell apart from the real you. And no, that's not a threat. Just a fact. Now, as to my business here... It seems you have stumbled upon something above your clearance. Well, no, stumbled is not the right word. Dug up, perhaps? And you are getting to the point where further digging would end in some fairly lethal gunshot wounds. This would be a sad state of affairs, 
as you are otherwise quite a good researcher. Therefore, you are getting something very few people in the Foundation ever get. An explanation. Yes, we were alerted when you first started digging into SCP-001. Every researcher who's been around for a while looks into it. Most are satisfied when they uncover the angel with the flaming sword. It's buried under enough levels. But then you started looking into the factory. And that is when I knew you wouldn't stop. So here it is. Plain and simple. The factory is... SCP-001. But it will never be written up. It was a choice I made early on in the creation of the Foundation, and a choice I still stand by. You researchers are far too curious. I'm not sure which scares me worse. That we'll never understand the factory, or that one day will. Oh well, I'm sure you're eager to learn more. The factory was built in 1835. Back then, it was known as the Anderson Factory, named after James Anderson, a rather well-to-do industrialist. It was built in, well, we'll just say America, and was the largest factory yet designed. A good mile across at its widest, three stories tall throughout, and a special seven-story tower by the front gate that Anderson lived in. It was designed to be the ultimate factory, capable of taking care of everything, including the housing of workers. People could be born, work, live and die without ever leaving the confines of the factory. And work they did on everything from cattle raising and slaughtering to textiles to everything else under the sun. Now, no one knows whether James Anderson was actually a Satan worshipper. It's just as likely that he followed some kind of pagan gods. What is known is that he was very exact in the building of his factory and in the placement of his machinery within it. Survivals claim the floor was engraved with arcane symbols that were only visible when blood flowed across them. But then the survivors claimed a lot of things. What is known is that Anderson made his money on the blood and sweat, and sometimes body parts of the lower class. His journals indicate he thought of them as less than human, being put on this earth only to serve his will. And of course, at that time, no one knew about his predilections, and so people flocked to the factory. A place to both work and live at the same time? <laughs> well, of course people wanted in. Never mind the harsh hours, working conditions, sadistic security force and all the rest. Factory workers were forced to work 16-hour days, work only shutting down on Sundays, between sunrise and sunset. Workers were not given individual rooms, instead sharing rooms with eight other people, sleeping in shifts of three. Medical attention was unheard of. If you were injured in the course of your duties, which most people were, you were expected to just keep working. Anyone too injured to work was dragged off by the security, never to be heard from again. For 40 years, the Anderson factory cranked out all sorts of things for people. Meat, clothes, weapons. Never mind that the beef might be mixed with human. I don't care that the weapons were forged in blood. No attention need to be paid that the clothes were dyed with. Well, you get the idea. Rumors leaked out, but the products were so good, 
Why bother? Until someone got out. I never met the brave soul who managed to escape, but she managed to meet with President Grant, and in 1875, he enlisted my aid. At the time, I was, well, it doesn't really matter. We'll say I was military, kind of, and that my people were the same. A hundred and fifty good men, and some few women, who were often given jobs that weren't supposed to be common knowledge. We'd been cleaning out some Confederate holdouts, and some of the worst things we had found down south. So, we did some research, didn't like what we saw, and went in, loaded for bear. Now, I don't actually remember much about the night it all went down. Most of it blends together in my head. I get flashes sometimes of the people chained to the line, living next to dead and damned hard to tell which was which. Children working underneath machines, the majority of the flesh scoured from their bones by the great wheels and cogs and the other things. No, no, I'm not alright. I haven't thought about that night for a very long time. The security force wasn't much of a problem. But then Anderson's creations showed up. He'd been taking the injured workers and, well, experimenting on them. Men, if you could call them men, with multiple arms sewn together some of them combined with animals, horrible monstrosities out of mankind's worst nightmares. And they kept coming, wave after wave of not quite living creatures. I lost a lot of good people that night. And then we found Anderson's breeding pits. I'm sorry, even today, more than a century later, the memory makes me see red. When we finally found Anderson cowering in his office, we hung him from his tower window with his own entrails. As he died, he laughed, saying it didn't matter. We could kill him, but his factory, the factory would go on. He was still laughing 24 hours later when we finally cut him down had him drawn and quartered, and then burned the remains. The entire time he uttered blasphemies that I don't like to think about. We spent a week cleaning that place out, freeing the workers, putting down the things we found in the basements and many lightless rooms. We pulled out things that were useful, stocked them in a house near the gate, tried to make sense of everything. A hundred and fifty of us went in that hell pit that night, and only ninety-three came out. By the end of that week, we were down to seventy-one. But the things we found in there, my god. Well, you've been with the Foundation a while. They wouldn't seem as amazing to you, but we found toy guns that shot real bullets. A yo-yo that would flay the skin from anyone it touched. Hammers that only worked on human flesh. A breed of skeletal horse that ran faster than anything we'd ever seen. Cloaks that seemed woven from the night itself and let men access a shadowy dimension that... Well, I get away from myself. We found tools both wondrous and horrible. And we were faced with the choice. I gathered my highest ranking, well, we'll call them officers, to me, and we tried to figure out what we could do. They all had opinions. The chaplain, he had gone a little crazed, thought all those objects must be miracles sent from God holy relics to be worshipped. 
Marshall and his little toady, Dawkins, thought there was a fortune to be made here, making and selling these things to the highest bidder. In the engine we all called bass, due to his deep speaking voice. He called these things an abomination, and declared that we should hunt down and destroy everything we could find. And Smith thought we should take this stuff back to the president. The only one without an opinion was the old man, but he never said much of anything anyways. We argued for hours and days trying to work it out. Me? I thought we were sitting on a gold mine all right, but that we could use these things, these objects, to hunt down some of the scary things we'd run into down south. The other monsters this world had to offer and use this factory for good as a place to contain these things, find a way to make them work for our fellow man or at least protect our fellow man from having to deal with them. Well, I'm sure you could figure out what happened. The chaplain snuck away in the middle of the night with his devotees, taking a couple of small items with him. Marshall, we kicked out when we found him, abusing his authority. He promised he'd get revenge, and that little Dawkins shit led the rest of their group off with some of the juicier items. Bass and his people tried to light the whole damn thing on fire then just left when it didn't work. And Smith left to report back to the president. I did manage to get him to promise me he'd tell Grant the factory had been destroyed. I had big plans for that place. Of course, it was kind of hard to follow through on big plans when you only have 12 other people to work with, but it was a start. And it worked for a while. We had these amazing toys, and finding people to work with us was easy. Back then, going off the grid was as simple as leaving town. We knew what we wanted. We knew what we could be. Leventhal set out getting us backing. A simple invention here, some well-invested money there. It all worked out. White and Jones set out getting us other backing. In our previous work, we'd found out some interesting things about people. Some secrets that powerful men didn't want getting out. And with our new position helping keep secrets, we got more people asking us to deal with their secrets. Blackmail is a dirty word, but it works. Bright, Argent, and Luminix got to work cataloging the items. Light and Bright's wife, the nurse, they made sure we kept ourselves healthy. Huh. Now, it's just remembering Light. She had such unusual ideas about hygiene for the time. Brilliant woman. Sklav, Fletcher, and Karnoff dealt with training the troops. Tesla and Tamlin we're in charge of figuring out how to take advantage of the items without making it obvious. We were amazing. The city we built around the factory, which we took to calling Site Alpha, was self-supporting. Agents, researchers, operatives of all sorts. Not by those names, of course, but those positions. We expanded. I'm sorry. I'm an old man. I know I don't want to look at it, but the body lies. The mind doesn't always remember right, and sometimes I get lost in my memories. Things get confused, but the long and simple of it is this. We used the factory. It always seemed to have more empty rooms to store things in. Back then, that was the word for them. Things. No skips then, no. We thought we had the factory tamed. That's one of the reasons I refuse to quit this job. If there's anything I can do here, it's remind people that we will never tame these things. Contain them, yes, 
But as we saw with Abel, tame them? Nah, never. After a decade or so, we were pretty organized. The 13 original of us were being called by numbers, not names. We knew how to make things work. And if a thing or two vanished inside the factory, still, in the occasional D class? What? Yes, we had D class back then. Disposables. That's where the D comes from. Had to have someone to test. Had to have someone to test things on. Tesla and Tamlin were both very firm about that. But yes, sometimes we lost people who didn't matter. Adam? Ah, sorry. Dr. Bright was fond of saying it was the factory taking its toll. You can't get something for nothing. 1911 was... <clears throat> 1911 was when it all went wrong. Things, and we'll call them fairies, an entire race of things living beside us. They could look the same as you or I. The only obvious difference was an allergy to iron. Yes, and that's why we called them fairies. And no, you haven't heard of them? Why? Because it's the one time the Foundation wiped out an entire race of things. Root and branch. And I'm the one who did it. We'd been hunting them for some time. We'd run into them a time or two before. Come out on top. So when a certain royal asked us for help, of course we were eager to get them in our debt. We've always loved having people in our debt. We sent a team to help out, take care of what we thought was a hunting party. And the next time we saw them, their heads were attached on poles, attached to the saddles of the creatures the fairies rode on when they attacked the factory. It was horrible. Three words, but they convey so much. I have never. I'm sorry. Please, just give me a moment. I've never told this part to anyone. You should consider yourself lucky. And if you ever tell anyone, any, of what I am about to impart on you. I will not just kill you, but everyone who shares your DNA in the worst ways possible. You'll think Procedure 110-MONTOCK is a walk in the park compared to what I do to you. We lost. The things came and they destroyed us, rode over our emplacements, slaughtered our people, shrugged off our weapons like they were nothing. I watched my 13 go down, left and right, just trying to hold the factory. And I? Their leader, their friend, their father figure, godfather to the Bright's four young children, confidant, sometimes lover, always the confessor. I ran. I ran like a scared little schoolboy, deep into the dark guts of the factory. I was chased by the things, always just one step ahead. I could hear them behind me, feel their breath upon my neck. And I came to a door I'd never seen before. A bronze door, covered in Arabic script of some sort. I've never been one for languages, especially not the curvy bullshit the muscle men use. But I didn't care. They were coming for me. And I threw the door open and dived through it. Everything inside was different. There was a feeling of peace that nothing could hurt me. The light was this dark red, but it still felt right. My ears were filled with the steady thrumming of a gigantic heartbeat. And in front of me were the remains of Anderson. It spoke to me then. 
but I'll be damned if I could tell you exactly what it said. What it told me was more of a meaning than exact. It offered me hope, told me that each of the things we had used from the factory, no matter what we did with them, it fed it, helped it grow. But if the fairies took the factory, they would destroy it. And we couldn't have that. And so, it offered me a deal. It could remove this event, make it have never happened. All I needed to give it was us. I didn't want to. I knew it was a bad idea. But then I saw them again. My family, my friends. Dead. Dead by the hands of those bastards. And I agreed. It smiled. And I found myself once more upon the ramparts, watching the horde of fairies crest the hill. My foundation alive once more. In my hands was a weapon. And I won't bore you with the details, but we slaughtered them. And with these new weapons, continued to slaughter them. Everywhere they lived, everywhere they bred. My fellow O5s questioned my decision, thinking we should save some in case we might ever need them. And I overruled them. We moved away from the factory, shut it down, moved our things out of there. We changed the name from things to special containment protocols, focusing on containing them, not anything else. The others were curious, but understood I had my reasons. I boarded up the factory, locked it shut, buried it under a ton of rubble, saying it was too dangerous. I thought I'd gotten away with it, until I found a thing on my desk. One of the old toy guns that shot real bullets, and it had the factory label on it. I've sent people in from time to time to see what it might be doing. Last time I sent people in to look, there was nothing there. We keep finding factory items out there. I can't help but to think how many more we don't find. The people who use them and keep it hidden. I think back to the body, telling me how each item used gave energy to the factory. I never asked it. Energy for what? I don't think I want to know. What do we give it? D-class mostly. Where did you think all those bodies went? There's a place. Bodies are left and they vanish. Everyone thinks I'm a genius for figuring it out. And sometimes, just sometimes, I have to feed it other things, researchers, agents, and they never know what's coming. It just reaches out and takes them. But in the end, we're doing more good by being here. Whatever the factory wants, whatever it is, we're doing good here. I have to believe that. And now you know. Are you happy? <laughs> no, I didn't think so. Why tell you? I'm getting old, Everett. Should I die, someone will have to keep feeding it. Maybe you'll be different. Maybe you'll figure out how to stand up to it. But I doubt it.